Hello again, and welcome back to another episode of Geek Out with Perry. Last time, we discussed covering some FAQs that we get from you, and we often get questions about our architecture and engineering methodology. But don't fret, there is a method to our madness. We discussed in-place upgrades versus migrations last time, and in this episode, we'll talk a little bit more about why Exchange is architected in a particular way. So in Exchange 2010, we made a change that made Outlook clients now connect to the CAS servers rather than the mailbox servers. Why this architectural change? Well, that's a long and interesting story, so I hope you've got some, got some time. Okay. Uh, we need to go back a little bit in time to think about uh, where we were when we were um, planning through Exchange 2007. And at that time, uh, you could think of Exchange as basically being a single process. Okay. Um, the, our store process sat on the, what was, we now consider the mailbox role. Mm -hmm. It still sits there. It was deeply entwined with all the protocols we supported. All the business logic that was about Exchange was stored in here. Mm -hmm. We did, in Exchange 2000, had introduced uh, some front ends, mm -hmm. but they were really just pass-throughs for uh, name unification. And all of our business logic was implemented directly in this one process. Uh, in many ways, this was a great thing for customers. If you go back to the early days of Exchange, um, uh, it was a struggle to build a, um, a server-level uh, application on the hardware that was available mm -hmm. and get it to scale. So every trick in the book was pulled to get every last ounce of performance. To get what we needed from a performance perspective, we ended up with the process uh, being something that we called uh, loosely structured and tightly coupled. Um, uh, when we were doing a review back in Exchange, uh, the beginning of planning for Exchange 2007 uh, with uh, Bill G, we had a little diagram uh, that looked a little bit like this. Each one of these uh, layers was <laughs> labeled and was a different protocol or piece of business logic that was entwined throughout uh, the process. Uh, loosely uh, structured means uh, there weren't clean layers with good interfaces between them. Tightly coupled meant that uh, you change something here, it would have profound effects over here and unexpected, unexpected uh, behaviors. It was beginning to be difficult to innovate and make changes in our system. We really needed to think about how we'd fix that. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, one path was to rewrite all of Exchange in one release. Okay. Uh, we've seen some competitors try that. Um, it usually ended up with them deciding that that was not going to be feasible because they wouldn't get all of their uh, functionality in one release, and they end up back on their original product. Um, the path we went down was uh, to uh, try and, uh, over a period of releases, separate out these layers in, uh, in a, a structured way and tackle each of these problems uh, in stages. Okay. So in the first release, what we did was we built a, a clean storage object layer. So what release is that? This was Exchange 2007. Um, that could sit uh, on a different, um, at a clean interface, and one of the tests of the clean interface was that it could sit on a different uh, machine. So you could actually not only have a process boundary, but actually the interface here was efficient enough it could work across machine. Mm -hmm. um, and it would talk to uh, the store through one protocol. So all of our protocols then would start coming through this uh, XSO layer. Transport, POP, IMAP, and Outlook Web Access all would come through this one layer. And our Exchange Web Services would be built on top of this. OWA. Oh, uh, POP, IMAP, and all the rest of it. And we started moving business logic out of here into this common layer that was in the middle tier. Okay. In Exchange 2007, we didn't have, uh, it, we, it was the richness that Outlook uh, 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 exhibits meant that we couldn't get to the point where we could move Outlook to also work through this, this layer. So that was the change we made in 2010 was we put a mappy head on top of Exchange storage objects that talked through the stack. 
So when we finish with Exchange 2010, we have one common layer of logic that's uh, cleanly architected and uh, separated out that every client ends up going through. Mm -hmm. This allows us to do some uh, nice things in terms of uh, implementing logic that does consistency checking on saves. For instance, with calendars, one of the historical big problems was enabling different clients like uh, Blackberries or Outlook or uh, uh, other phones and so on to uh, uh, apply uh, uh, business logic to the calendar, mm -hmm. but also end up with an entirely consistent uh, view of that calendar across all the devices. Mm -hmm. um, by having a single layer of uh, common logic they would all go through and having that cleanly architected, we could ensure at save time that the same business logic is being uh, followed uh, by all those devices while still giving them a lot of flexibility uh, to um, innovate uh, on the client side. So, um, so that's kind of the first step. By moving all this logic up here, the uh, amount of, uh, uh, of code that was important for the store process started shrinking. Okay. And what that has enabled us is that for the next release, we get to finish this three release cycle that we had planned and replace our store process with a new managed store. Right? Mm -hmm. um, by the time we hit Exchange 2010, everything above this line, above store, is managed. Um, we think this gives us uh, long-term good performance wins and great uh, uh, um, productivity wins in terms of being able to introduce innovation faster. In Exchange 15, the release after Exchange 2010, we'll finish this whole program and have replaced our, our underlying storage engine with uh, a new managed store and finish this three-release architecture. Um, this philosophy of, of thinking through and having a three-release strategy is something that we've that we're continuing, and um, uh, and you can sort of think of it as each release we think through a new three-release cycle rolling upgrade process to make sure that our code base stays fresh and uh, our ability to innovate uh, stays high. So, what benefits does this store rewrite give to our customers? Okay, so the coming rewrite that we're working on of the, the store layer, mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, a number of benefits to, uh, to customers. One is um, the size of the store is going to get a lot smaller. So there's um, both a performance, uh, robustness, failure rate, and um, uh, uh, attack surface area reduction that's going to be an important part of this thing. There's just less code involved um, because we don't have... Uh, the uh, replication of logic between the, these two layers. We finally get to clean that up. More importantly, though, um, as we're doing this rewrite, we're taking advantage of it to uh, uh, focus uh, our engine on being able to do things that were uh, are much more important now than they were 20 years ago. When okay. this uh, and specifically, this is around being able to do inferencing and uh, insight generation from the content okay. uh, and do much re richer searching uh, across the content. Those, these scenarios have become increasingly important and we expect it to continue to be important. So um, that's one of the key uh, areas of focus for the, the rewrite is making uh, our storage engine a uh, first class uh, um, piece of technology for, for those scenarios. Okay. Thanks for geeking out with Perry today. Follow Perry's blog, keep on sending feedback, and stay tuned for more episodes.